So obviously you guys know that Father Jim needs no introduction, but uh, I'm going to give him a brief one anyway. Uh, he's been at Holy Apostles for a long time, just got reassigned in his new assignment, so a lot of you guys know him really well. And uh, tonight he is going to give us the talk. I'm inspired every time I hear him talk. He's a great orator and a great priest and a great friend. Come on up, Father Jim. Well, it's called The Talk, and I suppose I should tell you what it's actually about. As many of us may have had the talk from our parents, hopefully our dads, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about mix, ma masculine sexuality, uncomfortable shifting, eyeing the exits. That's OK. <laughs> That's totally OK. It's not going to really be so much of a barnstormer, just hopefully kind of an upfront conversation, sort of a, a presentation not so much from a priest as from a brother and from a father. Um, whether or not your own dads gave you the talk or had the talk with you. Sometimes that talk might have set you on the absolute wrong path. But tonight what I'm hoping to do is offer a little bit of air into the room and what's usually an uncomfortable kind of conversation. If it gets a little too uncomfortable, we do have exits, we do have more beer, feel free to help <laughs> yourselves. Um, but the whole thing, as we consider everything that we do as Catholics, we have to understand the whys behind the what's. No longer can it suffice for somebody, especially in a college, to just say, well, do this or don't do that. God created us with brains, and we want to know. We want to know the whys. And it's so important to understand them, especially in a time when everything about sexuality, about what it means to be men and women, is so just confused and up in the air. And that's probably one of the greatest things that hinder society right now, and this isn't going to be a political stump speech, but there's a real brokenness in our world. It's undeniable, and it seems to be getting more and more broken. In his letter to the Romans in chapter 8, Paul talks about all of creation is groaning, waiting for the revelation of the sons of God, and the sons of God have freedom. And the freedom that we are called to, including in our sexuality, is something that is an important part of what God is doing. And this is proof that God is up to something. And that's something that is very encouraging and reassuring. As Father John Ricardo, a favorite of Keenan, says, Aslan is on the move. Like God is doing something in this world. And he wants us to be a part of it. And to be healed is an important part of his work. We hear great stories, Dustin and Keenan and so many men in this room who have encountered Jesus and have found transformation. And that's such a Catholic word. So often we look at our problems and we say, I know what needs to happen to fix this. No, we don't. What needs to happen is that we need transformation. And that's not something we can achieve just for ourselves. We need to be transformed. And as they say, healed people heal people. And this process of transformation is an expansive one. But we got to start with the bad news. We know that the world is tremendously broken. There is great confusion. There are deep wounds that so many of us carry. It's almost impossible to be a man today in 2022 without having gotten some scars along the way, whether it's perhaps a misguided but well-intentioned talk that our dads gave or an uncle or somebody else in our life, or if nobody ever sat us down and spoke to us, we've been getting spoken to all around from other sources. Our misunderstandings of sexuality, of our own humanity, the brokenness and sometimes the compartmentalization of what is meant to be a powerful force of good in our lives has oftentimes been stunted, the legs cut out from underneath us, and we continue to limp along the way and we don't talk about it because this is such a deep thing in our humanity that we tend to succumb to shame. Most of us want other people to think well about us. That's a good thing. That's a normal, healthy thing. But so often, especially with something so sensitive and so personal as our sexuality, we can hide it. We can hide that brokenness. We can kind of pretend like things are just fine. Or we try to rationalize it or say, yeah, that's, that's what guys do. And if you get another, enough other guys around you who do the same thing, you are convinced that that's normal or somehow healthy. I like a great image that Christopher West uses. Everybody in the world is like driving around on flat tires. But here comes along Jesus, who is perfect God and 
perfect man who's riding on fully inflated tires because he wants us to know what it looks like, that what we experience in our own day-to-day -day lives, so often the brokenness, the hurts, the bondage that we experience is not normal. That's not what we were made for. That's not why we exist. That's not what it means to be a man fully alive. Jesus shows us that, and Jesus was a man. He is a man. He is fully alive, and he invites that transformation for all of us. And this is, I think, what really helps us to understand the good news as deeply personable and applicable. Sometimes we think of the gospel as, yeah, that's a nice thing. Jesus, yay, three cheers. But until we can understand the dire need and the bad news, especially as it's expressed in my own heart, in my own behaviors, in my own tendencies, then we might not really think that it actually has something to do with me. And that if we don't understand the transformation that is possible in my own heart and in my own life, then we might just consider it almost like an abstract concept. The Lord wants to transform us, and he wants to make us whole. We know that we are called to be saints, to be holy, and there is no saint who is not integrated in their humanity. That's part of the process, and that's something I want to talk about tonight. The Catechism of the Church talks about the virtue of chastity. Chastity is a word that sometimes we might be slightly uncomfortable with. It's not celibacy. Celibacy is a dedicated state of life that refrains from any sexual activity for the purpose, especially in the Christian context, of serving the kingdom of God. But chastity is the right integration of our humanity, our bodily and our spiritual elements. It means to be whole. And so chastity is not something that we have to kind of scoff at or think is just for sort of prudes or guys who girls won't talk to. Chastity is something that helps us to be authentically whole, to be actual men, to be able to harness those powers that are built into us bodily as well as spiritually. We consider our humanity not just as brains on a stick. That's sort of one of the great confusions now is that I is somehow different than my body. And so if I don't feel comfortable in my body, it's like a machine. I can change out parts to suit it how I want, like a souped up car. But the reality is we are our bodies. Our bodies are us. We are embodied spirits, inseparable, one from the other. And it informs our whole worldview and our outlook. Now, it has to be said, and I'm not trying to paint with too broad a brush strokes here, but we are men, and men will experience their masculinity and the world in a very deeply unique way. Because let's face it, you all are looking this way, I'm the only one looking that way. Like our physical location sets us apart. We are distinct from one another. There will never be another you in this world. And so Pache, Tyler Durden, like, yeah, we are a little bit unique snowflakes. But <laughs> the reality is that we all share in a masculine nature as men and that we are created in a certain way, and our bodies indicate that. They reveal something about that. St. John Paul II spoke about a sacramental quality of the body. As Catholics, we really prize a sacramental worldview, meaning that we see the world around us as manifesting an invisible reality, that there is something behind what we are able to see and touch and taste and access. Catholics, we know we have the seven sacraments, which employ water and oil and bread and wine and word and gestures. These all cre they, they manifest that invisible, hidden grace that they communicate. But we see as Catholics the world around us communicating something spiritual. We're not just sort of seeing everything as just molecules or electromagnetic components, things that are just sort of material and that's that. The sacramental worldview that we have is to recognize the hand of a loving and orderly creator behind the beauty and the magnificence of the world that we see he is terrifyingly powerful as well as attractively beautiful. And in our humanity, we see in our bodies a sacramental-like representation of what it means to be a man. Now, please don't be scandalized. And I asked if they could videotape this, and I said, yeah, go ahead, but I, I reserve the right to edit as needed. But <laughs> it's important to remember that Jesus has a penis. <laughs> I'm not trying to be provocative here. But sometimes we forget that Jesus is a man, and he was incarnate intentionally as a man. Does this mean that women are second-class citizens? No. But there's something about the masculine embodiment, the human nature of what it means to be a man, that Jesus shows us. 
and that he not only restores, but also reveals something deeper, something more powerful that may not make sense unless we give it some thought. As men, our sexual organs are literally on the outside of our bodies. There is a certain initiation that men take in the reproductive act, that there is a certain strength, a certain outward focus that characterizes masculinity in its own unique way. Now, sometimes people speak about toxic masculinity, and usually by that they mean all men. But the idea of masculinity is a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful thing, just as the idea of femininity is a beautiful and wonderful thing. But men stand apart in a special way because of how we are created to interact with the world, with each other, with God, and how we are called to fulfill our vocation in the world. And so there is that real outward focus. Right around the time when boys start to realize the girls are actually kind of cute, is around the time that they're actually physically able to start to care for themselves too. And rather than allow them, their lives to be just about them, that attraction draws their focus away from them to someone else. Like, wow, look at her. That idea of attraction, sexual attraction, is something that is so good. And it's a mechanism, if you will, built in that draws us out of ourselves as we otherwise are at a stage in our lives where we can become so focused on ourselves. And Jesus, who is the son sent by the father, lives so utterly and completely for others. He lays down his life. We see his masculinity exercised by exerting real strength to be able to heal, to cast out demons, to restore sight is not an easy thing. Like praying over people is exhausting, especially if you do it all day. Like Father Chance, Father Matt, like after a couple masses on a Sunday, you just want to go and take a nap. Like I can't imagine the real strenuous schedule Jesus kept. He walked miles and miles for days, going from place to place. He fasted the incredible amount of strength and vigor this man had and has is something that is kind of a key for us to cue into a little bit. Because again, it shows us that we are given these things not for ourselves, not to impress people, not to just sort of sit back self-satisfied. We have been given these strengths, these gifts, so that we might live for others, that we might lay down our lives. Now, just a quick bit about women and their genius. I think Our Lady stands in a beautiful representation of what John Paul II calls the feminine genius. Throughout the scriptures, it says that she was confronted by a situation and pondered it in her heart. Women have a beautiful interiority that they're a bit more naturally disposed to than men. I think that's why so many of the holy women follow Jesus so readily. And the apostles, he just had to spend a lot more time on their camping trip help, helping them to get it. <laughs> but the same, men and women are complementary. We have different strengths. We have different capacities and qualities that are meant to complement each other. We don't buy into this BS of the war of the sexes. That's not of God. That is, a, that is a result of sin and brokenness and pride. Whereas the true givenness of our sexuality as men and women, as it physically complements each other, also spiritually and morally complements each other. So don't take any of this as, again, as sort of a, a chauvinism, but this is focusing on this particular trait that I think is not only so in, uh, jeopardized, but also so crucial, recovering it to actually help assist the Lord in the transformation of the world. This outward focus, this sense of strength, this initiative that, qual that characterizes the masculine spirit is something that means that we really have to be on our guard against passivity. Women tend to have typical vices that m many women fall into or they can as women. Men, we have our own. And that passivity is one of them. That passivity and, if you will, just laziness, that we tend to take the path of least resistance. We don't want to rock the boat. Sometimes we might be choleric and we like to start a fight. But generally speaking, we want to find just the easy way out. That's a vice. That's something that really hampers our humanity and prevents us from living who we are meant to be, from actually having an impact in the world, which every little boy dreams about. That's why we want to be superheroes and astronauts and policemen and firefighters, because we want to do something awesome in the world, and we want to have an impact that will last beyond us. We still do, but perhaps as we've gotten older, perhaps as we've gotten a little bit more broken, those dreams have started to fade. We've gotten a little bit more cynical. And I think those things are triggered and inflamed by the lack of chastity in our lives. Chastity, I mentioned that word earlier. 
Jesus shows us the perfection of all virtues, and he was perfectly chaste. Chastity is the right and full integration of the truth of our lives. And I want to emphasize that word truth. Sometimes, especially depending on how we were raised, the topic of sexuality, if it was ever talked about, was just basically addressed as something you never talk about. And so you had to kind of figure out a way, like these strong urges, these desires, what do I do with them? And sometimes we would start to live almost a double life, a certain duplicity. Like, well, when the strength of the temptations come on so strong, I can be a totally different person than when I'm in church. And that duplicity is a lack of integration. And that's something that leads us to hiding and to shame. And it really deflates us. Whereas chastity is the, is the result of the freedom of a lifelong pursuit of self-mastery. And that integration of our sexuality is so important because it has to do with the truth, the truth of our lives, the truth that sometimes as men, just evolutionarily speaking, we have a greater capacity and a desire for sex than women do. That's not something to ignore. That's something to sort of acknowledge and understand. We often, as I said, as men, have some real deep wounds and, and hurts. Some may have been sexually abused. We may have been introduced into sexuality uh, especially in disordered ways when we were younger. Maybe if you're like the average male at 11 years old is the average age now a young person is introduced to pornography and masturbation. Like that's probably something that has been a part of many men's story in this room. And it's something that for many of us still hasn't quite gone away. That's something we have to acknowledge, not just on the good days, but also on the bad days. And to realize that this call to chastity is the real integration of the truth of who we are as men with very re real and important qualities built into us by God. God made us this way. And this is something that is also broken because we know that sin ravages our lives. And if the devil wants to go to the heart of the matter, he'll go to something so deeply personal to all of us and something that we are very unlikely to go seek help for. But this quality of chastity acknowledges not just the truth of where I am, the truth of where I'm called to go, which is that full freedom of integration to love with excellence, but it also acknowledges with humility that there may be some distance between where I am and where I need to go, the freedom that I, my heart so longs for. I don't know if I know any man, even if he boasts about going to strip clubs or using prostitutes or watching pornography or masturbating regularly, is really proud of it. They may kind of make memes about it, but guys don't boast about that thing. Not like, you know, they talk about how proud they are of their sons when they, you know, got into college of their choice. It's not something that guys kind of, you know, go around and say, hey, guess what I did this weekend? I spent all weekend in my basement looking at naked women on my computer. Hey, it doesn't do that because we know it's so deflating. It's so contrary to who we are and who we want to be. That's part of the great gift of our sexuality is it's never going to let us be comfortable with that. Now, we might try to think that driving around with flat tires is normal and we might excuse it. We might just get more depressed and find that cycle of emotional pain and relief, emotional pain and relief. But that's not what Christ wants for us. That's not what we want for each other. That's not what the church is calling us to as men. That real property, that vir virtue of chastity looks at the reality of our lives, and it gives us every help along the way. First and foremost, the healing and the grace of Christ. There's something about our sexuality that I really wish guys would, more, would be more honest about with ourselves, with each other, but even before, with God. Like, have you ever just turned to the Lord in prayer and said, Lord, I'm really horny. Like, I don't know what to do with this. Like, Lord, I really just want to go and binge on pornography right now. Or, Lord, like, I don't know why you gave me genitals. I don't know what it means to be a man. Like, those are good prayers. Those are completely within the rules. Pray in that way because it's real. It's honest. God built us with very strong elements as men, and they're meant to be good. They're meant to be used for good. But sometimes, like horses out, out of rain, they can go wild. Talk to God about it, please. What a great way to enter into a deep, intimate conversation with our Lord. You know, as I said, women tend to have that disposition to interiority and therefore to a sort of contemplative or relational prayer with God. I think in many ways, God, kind of having the last laugh, put this into us because it's so deeply personal and because it's so out of our control so often, or at least is so unruly, 
that it's a great conversation starter. It's a wonderful topic to bring to prayer. If perhaps you've had pornography in your life, if you have memories of, of sexual sins, go to adoration. The power of just simply adoring the Blessed Sacrament, being with Jesus in the Eucharist, that sacrament which is, this is my body given up for you, is the great remedy for, that is your body taken for me. Spend time with Jesus in the Eucharist and allow him to heal those memories. He knows them. He was there. He sees everything, much better than Santa Claus ever will. <laughs> Don't think you can fool God. But if you go to God saying, Lord, you made me to be free, and I feel anything but right now, God says, all right, that's a good start. Let's go. And as our Father, he will never shame us. He will never shun us. Remember back in the garden, the real big flaw of Adam and Eve, yeah, they disobeyed God, yeah, they, ad, they ate the fruit, but they tried to hide from God, and then they shifted the blame. Don't hide from God, but also don't hide from each other. This is a real thing that sometimes the devil uses against us, is that sense of shame and isolation. They say daylight is the best disinfectant, and I, you know, I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands, but good chances a lot of guys, I mean, if, if national statistics hold, a lot of guys in this room are right in the same exact boat. Okay, that's where we are, that's where we are. So where do we start? And to love, and to support, and to encourage, and to hold each other accountable, and to help each other come back to the one who is able to heal, Jesus Christ. To help encourage and reinforce if counseling is needed. Sometimes we've got to bring out the big guns, absolutely. That's not a loss, that's a big win, because it's a real concrete step towards freedom, towards real integration, towards wholeness. And that's what brothers should want for each other more than anything. This reality of the fraternity that we are called to, Jesus gathered to himself the apostolic band, and they lived together almost every waking hour. I mean, good chances the apostles saw each other naked. They ate together, they fished together. It says that Peter was lightly clad when he jumped into the water, well, he clad himself before jumping into the water to go meet Jesus on the seashore. Like, there's something about vulnerability among men that's very difficult. One, because it needs to be built on trust. Men, we don't trust each other readily, and that's probably sometimes smart. Um, but we need friends who we know care about us, who have our back, so that we can have the environment that we can start to open up those conversations. It may be a little immodest to just go into a room full of strangers and say, hey, these are my deepest, darkest secrets. Bleh. But to know these men and to have them know you and to know that they care for you and that they are there for you, no matter what you're going to tell them, it's such a wonderful place to be able to start that process of integration because you got brothers who can either share their side of the story, reflect you back to yourself, or just say, hey, all right, you know, you stumbled, let's get back up, let's keep going. But this itself is under threat, and this is one of the things I admire and praise so much about the Men's Inferno, is male friendships are, it's an endangered species. Um, men tend to readily sacrifice their friendships way too quickly. Now, as we get older, we know it takes a lot of investment and effort and energy to maintain friendships. And in college, it's easy because th you're there, you've got classes, you've got sports together. As you get onto your career and you have kids and it starts getting more and more difficult, the, the, the trend is for um, men's friends to be just effectively their wives' friends' husbands, like the, you just see it in Little League games. And that's not a good thing. It's an important thing to have men who know us and, again, who we trust. But one of the great confusions, and this is where I'm going to start to get a little specific and I'm going to wrap it up, one of the great dangers is um, with not only our sexuality, with something like masturbation or pornography, but I think this is something that also kind of puts us a little off edge. And this is something that I think most people understand is off or not right, but we don't know what to say about it, let alone do about it. But sometimes we are a little we are afraid to be vulnerable because we kind of think it's a little, I'm not going to use the G word, but you know, let's face it, men tend to not like to be vulnerable because we aren't always sure of the intentions of the other, whether it's a lack of trust. Sometimes with this whole specter of, well, there are men who have same-sex attraction. We might think, well, okay, that means that they're going to hit on me. This specter, if you will, has really taken a toll on male friendships because we don't feel like we can actually trust each other, like we can be with each other, we can share these kinds of things. And I'm not saying that somebody who has same-sex attractions is the problem. 
I'm seeing a culture that says this is the highest goal and priority or this is an actual complete identity. That's something that we are right, I think, to push back on. Just a little rabbit hole. If you look at the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it talks about homosexual acts, not as an identity. This is something that the church, I think, really has an important thing to offer to the modern conversation. It wasn't until about the 18th century where the idea of homosexuality as an identity was a thing. Up until then, it was either described as sodomy, the Greek sin, homosexual acts in a variety of perhaps different expressions. And there were maybe certain contexts in prison or uh, certain other military situations where there may have been those activities, but nobody ever kind of said, this is who I am. And I think that's an important thing that the church has to teach us for two important reasons. The one I've already mentioned is that if we sort of reduce somebody's identity to that, then we start to be suspicious of who they are. We know that we are all capable of the best and the worst. And if we understand that men can do actions that we're not proud of or that we ought not do, we can still relate to them on a certain level. Versus somebody saying, this is who I am and this is something I celebrate, that is a little bit harder to deal with in a healthy way. But the second reason I think the church has to reclaim this reality is because so often people reduce themselves to that identity and they see their sexual, their sexual desires as the most important quality about who they are. And we push back hard and say, no, that is not. You are a child of God. You were made in his image and likeness. You were made for freedom, not to be enslaved, let alone to celebrate sexual behaviors that deviate from what they were made for, who we were made to be as men. And I'm not advocating sort of a shallow machoism, but there's something as the community of brothers that we really have to be careful and cautious to make sure that we are helping to raise all of our brothers up, no matter what their self-identity is, but to always call them to the wholeness of the gospel message, which is nothing other than full integrity and freedom. Now, it's a fact that sometimes if guys are involved with basic pornography, heterosexual pornography, little by little, just the mechanisms of addiction can start to go into more extreme forms, into animal stuff, into homosexual stuff. Like sometimes that's a part of somebody's experience. That doesn't mean that somebody is gay. That doesn't mean that somebody has same-sex attractions. That's something that might need to be worked out in confession and counseling, hopefully maybe with bro trusted brothers, but sometimes it's such a complex thing, you might need a little bit more sophisticated advice. But the reality is, is that brokenness help, prevents us from re really understanding the goodness and the wholeness of our sexuality. That it is not only something that is meant to be an initiation, but also meant to be life-giving. And this is, I think, what I want to leave us with. Every one of us made in the image and likeness of God is called to be fruitful. This is kind of the guiding line for a lot of our understanding about our sexuality. Men, especially, we want to be generative. We like creating things, especially with our hands. We like to garden, we like to paint, we like to build stuff. We want to see the fruits of our labors. And that itself is an expression of this desire to be generative, but we want spiritual children. We want biological children. We want a progeny beyond us, but we want to give of ourselves. That's at the heart of every other expression through our sexuality, even the broken ones. As the old songs say, we're looking for love in all the wrong places. Like what we want is at the heart of even our most deviated or disordered behaviors. And so rather than be succumb to shame or think that I'm broken and I'll never be fixed, we have to recover a sense of what it's all for in the first place, that we were created by God to participate in his generativity, to help give life to others. And we do that as married men, as single men, as celibates. We can do that biologically, and that's what the sexual function is for. That's why masturbation is a disordered action, because it's taking what is meant to be ordered towards another and towards union and towards life and makes it a selfish gratification. It's the misuse of that function. That's why the church calls it a sin. Now that might be the first time some in this room have ever heard that because it's not, face it, something we hear from the pulpit on Sundays. But the fact is, it is something that is not a good thing. It does hamper us. I would say it even in many ways neuters us. It makes us passive. It enslaves us in a particular form of bondage that is increasingly difficult to get out of because it can become a learned habit an escape from dealing with stressful situations. 
Oftentimes, if guys are dealing with anger or loneliness or self-pity, they had a hard day or a week at work if they're having an argument with their spouse, hey, this works. This will give you a moment of pleasure and escape. And we go in for that. And then all of a sudden, we feel worse than before. And then that emotional cycle resets, which is what I was talking about earlier. But this is a very common sin. We hear it a lot in the confessional. And I'm glad to hear it in the confessional. Better that guys come and lay it out. And let's do something about it. Let's move. Let's change. If this is something that God has blessed you to never have to do with, praise God for that. Be a cur- an encouragement and a support to your brothers who do. Never look down on anybody else. Never look down on somebody who may be struggling in ways that we will never imagine. Whether it's with addictions, whether it's with sexual desires that we don't understand or we may really want to indulge, but we know we can't because they aren't what God has intended for us and they are a misuse of our sexuality. We have to know that we are called all the same as beloved sons of God and how we can help somebody carry their crosses. I really believe in heaven, as we get to know other people's stories, we'll hear some incredible stories of heroism of men and women who struggled with same-sex attraction, knowing that although this was an experience of broken sexuality, that they knew that they wanted to be fully free. And in that pursuit of chastity, they found it. And they perhaps will have a brighter crown than somebody who never had such a struggle. People who have to deal with pornography addictions or any form of addiction, these, as we struggle with them, can be great sources of glory as we struggle, as we overcome them, as God overcomes them in us. So, brothers, hopefully tonight, um, again, maybe letting some air into the room, this is a conversation that hopefully is not just something that you only have here. You don't have to have deep, like, staring into each other's eyes conversations about it. It's kind of weird. But as it comes up in the core groups, as it comes up just in fellowship or in conversation, as it comes up in confession with a priest, you know, so be it. Don't be ashamed of it. Allow it. Because, again, daylight is the best disinfectant. Isolation is not healing. God wants us to be free. The world needs us to be free. And God willing, we'll have a real appreciation for the gift, the virtuous power that is chastity, which is that full integration of who we are as men, body and soul, and the excellence to love, to love as Christ himself, true God and true man loved. Thank you. So thank you very much, Father Jim. Uh, Yeah, that was fantastic. Man, tonight was just such a refreshing thing. Pastels are power. You know, we got Mike Dill, and we got Dustin, we got Keenan wearing pastel blue shirts. It's amazing. (laughs) No, it was great. So a couple of quick announcements and a couple of quick calls. So if you guys look around the room, there's a lot of guys here. And Father Jim talked about what I just to ask in closing is that you consider what Father Jim talked about. The one thing that I really appreciate about Inferno is when I grew up in the Catholic Church, actually at this parish, Holy Apostles, um, I actually went to preschool across the street uh, and then here when they built the church, is the fact that there weren't groups of men like this when I was growing up. So don't take this for granted. You know, if you, if you were in this room for the first time and you don't know any of the guys, get to know some of the guys here in the room. We care about you and we want you to uh, be able to, to grow and to do what Father Jim talked about. Um, you know, it's, I, I remember, you know, the last three years or four years that I've been involved in Inferno, just such a powerful, powerful opportunity to be able to be around other powerful men that care about their wives, that care about their kids. Maybe they're divorced, maybe they're single, maybe they're married. It's, it's one of those things where I can't tell you how much I, I respect that, Keenan. You know, with, with you having going through your story, you're, you're not alone. You know, we're here for you. And Dustin, you know, being willing to share your struggle, we're here for you. And I'm so grateful that the priests are here. And so there's a couple of powerful opportunities that we're going to have. So um, if you guys in the back could raise your hands, everyone here that's, uh, there's two opportunities that we have to kind of step into our role as men. 
Um, so if you guys look at the back, we've got D11 Achievement Alliance with Advocates for D20 Kids. On my left in the back is Mike Dill, who is here with his buddies from the D11 Achievement Alliance, Advocates for Kids. Uh, in D20, they're committed to helping keep the school districts focused on academics and to keep harmful ideologies out of the school curriculum and to support parental rights. And so if you guys have kids, definitely reach out to them and just see what they're doing. Uh, we also have Sidewalk Advocates for Life. So on my right, Bill Slack, he's raising his hand. Also Pastel Blue. For some reason, Pastel Blue is, is the thing for tonight. Uh, he is manager for Victory of Life, an Inferno initiative to close our local abortion facilities by the end of 2023. Yes, you heard that right. Inferno has partnered with Sidewalk Advocates for Life to save souls from abortion where it happens. When women pull up to Planned Parenthood, they often wish that God would give them a way out. Instead of going in, they can be met by loving presence and someone who can connect them with free life-affirming medical resources that make parenting suddenly possible. Sidewalk Advocates for Life are in 239 locations have saved 18,000 babies, rescued 85 one, uh, abortion workers from the industry, closed 29 facilities since 2014. Inferno men are going, to going into the breach and making Colorado Springs closure number 30. I encourage you to talk to Ben and sign me up for more information. So there's also a card on all of your tables. And so, again, just uh, I'll close with some announcements, but just look around the room and, you know, thank you, Father Matt. Is it Father Matt or Father Mark? Father Matt. Father Matt, uh, for allowing us to be here a little bit later. We were able to graciously be here till 930. We wanted to keep everything tight in terms of the talks so that you guys had a chance to fellowship afterwards take advantage of that please you guys are here we love you we we care about you we want you to fellowship with each other so find a man that you know you can relate to or that invited you and be able to build that relationship because it's such a unique thing in colorado springs so some announcements uh next saturday september 24th from 4 to 10 there's a family fun night sponsored by pikes peak citizens for life and save the storks at lost island with games concert by matt bowen my, Matt and Bowen Hammett, uh, kids under 12 are free, and it's just $10 for kids 13 and older. All proceeds will support Save the Storks. So see Luke if you have uh, any questions about that. Saturday, October 1st from 5.30 to 9 p.m. Keenan, I know you're going to want to go to this. It's the St. Gabriel the Archangel Marriage Forum. All right. So uh, feel free to attend that with your wife. Um, Inferno is all about opportunities. So if it's an opportunity to go to a date night with your wife, that's just a fabulous opportunity because we're trying to constantly in Inferno leadership to include our wives, include our kids, include our sons, include our daughters. We just want to create an, a, a culture of evangelization for our families. Uh, Saturday, November 5th, this is an important one, an all-day event at Antlers Hotel, downtown Colorado Springs. It's our annual co men's conference with Bishop Kolka, uh, Bishop Golka, Chris Stefanik, Deacon Harold, uh, Dr. Burke Sivers, and Dr. Michael Butler, or Barber. Uh, tickets are available at infernomen.com, and there's an early bird discount available until September 23rd with the promo code First Wave. So if you guys want that information, just come see me. There's a competition to see which parish can get the most men registered. And it, the uh, thing, the award is this wonderful, heavy, <laughs> shield. I'm speaking out Holy Apostles. So come on, Holy Apostles, get it. Corpus Christi can't get it this year. Yes, so. we can. <laughs> No, you're out, Jeff. No, it's, it's a friendly competition, but we're expecting a few hundred men at this conference. We got the bigger room. We got some big speakers coming in. We're excited about it. And you know what the greatest thing about Inferno, and I'm going to close with this, 
It's just I remember during the pandemic, everything was crazy, and there was a lot of tough, difficult things that were going on in life. And I just remember one of my highlights of that year was being able to go to that men's conference, that outdoor conference. Was anybody at that one? Yeah, yeah there's a, a bunch of men that were here. And I just remember in a time where everyone was shutting down and nobody wanted to get together and you can't look at anybody, just like Keenan was saying, we were together. We were safe. We were compliant with the law. We were doing everything that we could. But we got together and we did a thing. And that's important with Inferno. So I will close with that. And Father Matt, will you lead us in a closing prayer? Thank you, Trent. Uh, it's really Father Tom, the pastor who you have to thank. I really had nothing to do with you being here late. So, <laughs> but uh, thanks for being here, guys. And uh, let's pray to Our Lady, who will continue to teach us about the manhood of her Son. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And would my brother priest join me in blessing everyone here. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. So that concludes tonight. Feel free to definitely talk to each other. We have about an hour to socialize and have a great night. <laughs>